our session, International Symposium, Bangladesh. I would like to request Dr. Tariq Reja Ali to moderate the session. Respected Chairman, Co-Chairpersons, and the learned audience, it is a great honor for us, and at first I want to thank all in the Ophthalmological Society for inviting us and give, giving this opportunity to present our papers in this August gathering, that is 80th All India Ophthalmological Society Congress 2022. This session is being chairperson, chairperson is our respected Professor Abha Hussain. She will be presiding this session. We have two co-chairpersons, Professor Ashraf Said, Chairman Scientific Committee, Ophthalmological Society of Bangladesh, and also Vice President of Ophthalmological Society of Bangladesh. We have another co-chairperson, Dr. Shaukut Kabir. He is the Joint Secretary General of Ophthalmological Society of Bangladesh, and me, Tariq Reja Ali, Secretary General of Ophthalmological Society of Bangladesh, is really, really very much happy to conduct this session. As you know, the regular moderator, Dr. Mohammad Mustaq Ahmed, couldn't join us because of some prob that is regulations, rules and regulations with the government. So he couldn't come. So uh, without any delay, we want to start our session. We, we are missing our two presenters here, Dr. Mustaq and Dr. Inamul Shomo. But we have four presenters. I will ask them to come over here and present their topic. At first, I will request uh, Dr. Rifat Rashid. She will be presenting her case. She is a oculoplasty associate professor of oculoplasty, and she is working at Ispahani Islamia Eye Institute and Hospital. Dr. Rifat, please. Thank you, sir. Honorable chairman, respected teachers, and audiences, good evening. Thanks to Ophthalmological Society of Bangladesh and All India Ophthalmological Society for giving me the opportunity to present here. My to today's topic is correction of congenital and acquartosis, decision making and techniques. There is no financial interest to disclose. We know tosis, the term derived from the Greek word to fall, that is drooping of the upper lid. And the ptosis correction is challenging, and it requires correct diagnosis, thoughtful planning, and good surgical technique. It can be classified as congenital acquired. So congenital ptosis include unilateral and bilateral severe congenital ptosis, Marcus Gunn's jaw winking phenomenon, and blepharophimosis syndrome. In acquired ptosis, it can be classified as third nerve palsy, myasthenia gravis, aponeurotic ptosis, traumatic ptosis and the mechanical ptosis may be due to edema, inflammation, and lead tumor. So the treatment may be non-surgical, that is the rehabilitative crutch spectacles, or surgical, which is a definite treatment. So what are the indications for ptosis correction? If the patient presented with severe ptosis with poor levator function, when there is cosmetic concern, when there is associated amblyopia and squint, blepharophimosis syndrome and Marcus Gunn's jaw winking phenomenon. And which procedure we have to choose that depends upon the amount of ptosis, the amount of levator function and associated anomaly. So the main uh, surgical management depends upon the amount of levator function. If the levator function is more than 10 millimeter and the ptosis is less than 2 millimeter, we can go for Fasanella Sarvet procedure. And if the uh, ptosis is more than 2 millimeter and with good levator function, then we can go for levator resection. If the levator function is less than 10 millimeter, uh, then uh, if it is more than 4 millimeter, we can go for levator resection. If the amount of ptosis tos uh, is severe and uh, levator function is less than 4 millimeter, then we have to go for frontalis brow suspension. So now the frontalis brow suspension, it is the uh, most effective surgical treatment for moderate to severe congenital ptosis with poor levator function. And it involves attaching the tarsal plate to the frontalis muscle. This is a patient with the unilateral and this is the bilateral um, cases of uh, severe congenital ptosis. So in case of frontalis brow suspension, the mat materials we can use the preserved or autologous fascia lata, silicon rod, tem temporalis fascia, proline, uh, frontalis muscle wrap, Gotex strips or supramid. 
Now, uh, this is a patient presented with a left uh, severe congenital ptosis. So we did the frontalis brow suspension surgery uh, by Fox procedure and with silicone rod by giving five stab rhomboid incision and the finally the, the rod is passes uh, through the submuscular plane, sleeve is passed and the lead position is adjusted and finally uh, the uh, checked that uh, lead is in normal position and frost suture is bad. We can do uh, frontally sling surgery with fascia lata. This is uh, the pre and post operative uh, photograph of a patient uh, who had underwent frontally sling surgery with fascia lata. Uh, but we preferred frontally uh, sling surgery with silicone rod because it is uh, flexible, easily available, cheap, less time consuming. This is a patient presented with bilateral slings, uh, severe congenital ptosis. This is after right eye surgery. This is after left eye surgery. This is one year post-operative after bilateral sling surgery with silicone rod. This is another patient. This patient presented with traumatic ptosis. And there was very difficult to find out the levator muscle. So we did frontally sling surgery in this case. Now the Marcus Gansau winking phenomenon. This patient presented with uh, right ptosis with Marcus Gansau winking phenomenon uh, and there is a synchitic movement uh, of the lead uh, with the movement of the jaw. So first we give lead crease incision. After lead crease incision the orbicularis muscle is dissected. Then the levator muscle is separated from the upper border of the tarsal plate. The horn of the uh, levator muscle in medial and lateral horn is cut and the levator muscle is excised. After excision of the le uh, levator muscle, part of levator muscle, we did the frontally sling surgery, just uh, did uh, the routine, what we do. The sling, uh, silicon rod is passed through the submuscular plane. The sleeve is passed and the position of the lead is adjusted. The orbicularis and the uh, skin is repaired by layer. We prefer to uh, pass the two end of the silicone rod a little bit far away from the original wound to prevent uh, granuloma, suture for granuloma formation. So this is a patient presented with a levator, uh, Marcus Gansau wink winking phenomenon and he underwent uh, levator disinsertion with frontalis suspension and there is no synchinetic movement of post-operatively. This is another patient having Marcus Gansau winking. This is the post-operative and synchinetic, synchinetic eye movement is disappeared after surgery. Now the blepharophimosis syndrome, the patient presented with telecanthus, bilateral severe ptosis, epicanthus in inverses. So we do bilateral YV plasty first with medial canthal uh, ligament shortening and then uh, we do after six months, we prefer to do after six months the bilateral sling surgery, same sitting. This is one year post-operative and this is five year post-operative. This is another patient uh, having bilateral sebiotosis with blepharophimosis syndrome. This is after YV plastic. This is after frontally sling surgery. Now the levator resection. We always follow the Beard's rule. And in case of sebiotosis, we can do the levator resection surgery. Uh, sometimes we do supermaximal levator resection also. So uh, this patient presented with uh, left sebiotosis with a good levator function, so we do levator resection surgery. After lead crease insertion, the levator orbicularis oculi is dissected. The tarsal plate is exposed. Then the levator, uh, the orbital septum is exposed and the orbital septum is cut. The fat is prolapsed and the fat is retracted up. The levator muscle is uh, separated from the upper border of the tarsal plate. The medial and lateral horn is cut. And it is uh, separated up to uh, the desired amount, what to be resected. After separation of the levator muscle, uh, we give three knot. One is the central knot and the, at the center of the tarsal plate and that is passed through the center of the levator muscle. And it is at the level uh, how much we want to correct. So another two uh, suture is placed medially and laterally. The redundant uh, levator muscle is excised and the repair of the uh, orbicularis holding the levator stump to form a lead crease. 
this is a, a, at the end of the surgery. So this is a patient with uh, right severe ptosis. This is a uh, two weeks post-operative after levator resection. This is six months after levator resection. So this is another patient. She had uh, left severe ptosis with uh, poor levator function. And uh, this is post-operative after supermaximal levator resection. This is another patient having left severe ptosis. This is two weeks post-operative. So now uh, we have some cases where surgery is very difficult for those cases uh, there is a, if we do uh, surgery there will be chance of exposure keratitis so for those cases uh, the non-surgical process is the crust spectacle this is a patient presented with congenital third nerve palsy and there is no ocular motility uh, which was restricted, and we give the crust spectacle. This is another patient presented with bilateral severe ptosis and with uh, total ophthalmoplegia. This is a patient with CPEO, so we give crust spectacle. So few complications we observe in uh, some of our cases, that is overcorrection, undercorrection, lash ptosis or entropion, ectropion, suture granuloma, which is the common complication which happens in, uh, especially in case of frontally sling surgery. And an another complication is like exposure keratitis, conjunctival prolapse, poorly formed lead crease, lag ophthalmos. And another complication is the postoperative lead lag. Lead lag and lag ophthalmos is uh, common in all cases. And uh, before surgery, it is better to counsel the patient that lead lag and lag ophthalmos will be there. So functional uh, success of ptosis surgery is very important of the eyelid position and above uh, position of the lead is above pupillary margin. So correct diagnosis and suitable surgical procedure will give symmetrical and satisfactory result. Thank you all. Thank you for patience hearing. Thank you, Dr. Rifat. It was a nice presentation, nice surgery. And actually we have, uh, that is, uh, Few, uh, we selected our cases in this way that we could cover all the subspecialty. Now I will request our next presenter, Dr. Feddo Sakta Jolly. Uh, she will be presenting her topic and she is an Associate Professor of Ophthalmology, Bardem General Hospital. Dr. Feddo Sakta Jolly, please. Good evening. I am very much thankful to Ophthalmological Society of Bangladesh and All India Ophthalmological Society for giving me the opportunity. Today, my topic is phacoemulsification in vitrectomized eyes, a nightmare or a daydream. Even the most courageous human in history may have one common thing that is a dread, dreaded nightmare and ophthalmologist nightmare. Or maybe a nightmare dressed as a daydream is post vitrectomized eyes awaiting for phacoemulsification. We know cataract develops and progresses in up to 70% of patients within two years after persplenar vitrectomy. So cataract surgeons need to understand the higher risk of intraoperative complications in these cases. And also successful cataract surgery is necessary to restore vision and also to give clear view to the vitreotinous specialist to monitor posterior segment. Why FACO is challenging in case of vitrectomized eyes? Number one, Cataract that develops following vitrectomy are the denser nuclear sclerosis and also posterior subcapsular type rather than senile cataract. Number two, that patients have small pupils that prone to develop reverse pupillary block. Lack of posterior support for the cataractous lens makes performing capsular excess more difficult. Removal of lens matter also became complicated and more anterior depth fluctuation. Number four, occult zonular descents may happen. Number five, posterior capsular damage or posterior capsular fibrosis may be developed that lead to increased chance of nucleus drop during surgery. Now I want to share a few case, such cases that I have faced very 
uh, very much challenges. One case, 35 years a diabetic, high myopic patient who had a history of trauma in right eye in 2004 and developed regmatogenous retinal detachment with subretinal hemorrhage and choroidal effusion in right eye and underwent 360 degree bell buckle per splenar vitrectomy, endolaser, and C3 F8 gas exchange in right eye in 2004. That patient came to us in 2019 September with gross deterioration of vision. Her, his visual acuity was counting finger two feet in both eyes, dense cataract in both eyes, and as much as I could notice through slit lamp, there was no phacodinesis or zonular instability. Fundus was not, uh, fundoscopy was not possible due to dense cataract, and uh, B scan shows atters to retina. So our plan was to do phacoemulsification with posterior chamber well implantation in right eye under local anesthesia. So we started FACO, but there was an unpleasant surprise waiting for me, that is uh, zonular dehiscence extending from 4 to 8 o'clock areas. In this case, capsulorexis became very much difficult as there was zonular dehiscence and a lack of posterior support, and I have to put viscoelastic substance several times to complete the Capsulorexis. Then I introduced CTR into the bag, and uh, I couldn't have a segment at that time. And one thing we should keep in mind that opening of the CTR should be opposite to zonular dehiscence. And uh, then I did uh, hydrodissection and hydrodelineation very generously. And uh, here, nuclear rotation was not possible after trying several times. Then I tried to complete the FECO. Then I complete the FECO with uh, low flow, uh, low flow rate and low vacuum, and as there was uh, to reduce the stress in the capsular bag. Lastly, I. Uh, uh, completed the FECO and introduced a multi-piece eye well into the bag. And uh, placing the haptic of eye well along the, towards the zonular dehiscence area. If we could see any zonular dehiscence during surgery, we have two options in hand. One, we can continue FACO with capsular hook in, in the zonular dehiscence part, or we can do FACO with the help of CTR or segment. Or we can con convert the case into S ICC with SFI well implantation. Now, I will share two small people cases. One case, 62 years diabetic male had advanced diabetic eye disease in right eye and underwent persplenar vitrectomy, membrane peeling, endolaser, and fluid air exchange in right eye. That patient came to us with cataract and small pupils. We plan to do FACO with the help of hook. And another uh, small pupil case, high myopic 45 years, that patient had regmatogenous retinal detachment and underwent persplenar vitrectomy with fluid air exchange, endolaser, and silicon oil implant in right eye. That patient had cataract with small pupil along with silicon oil in the entry chamber and posterior synechia that, uh, in that eye. We plan to do FACO with B hex ring. My small people, first small people case, in that case I used uh, uh, iris hook to enlarge the people and then completed the FECO in usual where I did here uh, direct chop method and, and I preferred to use multi-piece eye well in vitectomized eyes. And another small people case, who that patient had silicon oil in the anterior chamber, so I had to wash the anterior chamber and clean the, uh, clean the silicon oil at first. Then I introduced BHEX, then I did synechiolysis for posterior synechia. After that, introduced BHEX ring to enlarge the pupil. 
thereafter rest of the uh, portion of the FACO is uh, uneventful. And I did here uh, direct chop method to reduce the stress over the capsular bag. Now another case, uh, posterior capsular fibrosis, that is 57 years old male, diabetic male, had vitreous hemorrhage in left eye for a long period and had history of perspilinal vitrectomy, membrane peeling, endo laser and silicon oil implant in left eye. That patient referred by a VR surgeon, there might be a defect in the posterior capsule or damage during perspilinal vitrectomy. So that case, I uh, completed that case as a po posterior polar cataract. Here, uh, we should not do hydro dissection. Only we did uh, hydro delineation, and there was no capsular damage, only capsular fibrosis in that case. And here also I implanted multi-piece eye well into the bag. Another option is uh, there for uh, post vitrectomous case that is femtosecond laser assisted cataract surgery. That paves a new way to complete cataract surgery and to redo, to do capsulorexis and nuclear fragmentation with the help of femtosecond laser assisted cataract surgery. And to also we can uh, reduce the stress over the uh, capsular bag and also it is helpful for zonular dehiscence cases. Now I will share some pre and post operative considerations. Number one, biometry. I will power calculation may be inaccurate uh, in that cases as there is possibility of hypermetropic surprise. As the vitrectomized case, I will many lens may be more posteriorly placed. And optical biometry is more accurate than ultrasound biometry in vitrectomized eyes. In case of silicon oil filled eyes, axial length uh, measurement will be inaccurately long unless compensating factor is used. Many of the machines have uh, provisions for calculating axial length in silicon oil filled eye. And if cataract is dense, that case immersion ultrasound is preferable. Informed consent process for the vitrectomized eyes should be customized to take into account the several unique challenges that may happen during cataract surgery. And increased uh, patients and patients attendants should be informed about the increased risk of paraoperative events. I will selection also important. Here, chip is uh, I will may be necessary for uh, implanting into the bag or into the ciliary sulcus. And in postoperative case uh, care, we should give uh, uh, oral acetazolamide as uh, there is uh, always not possible to complete removal of viscoelastic substance uh, because of zonular dehiscence and uh, to reduce the intraocular immediate postoperative intraocular pressure and also to give oral acetazolamide to reduce immediate postoperative inflammation. And uh, in long-term care, the uh, cases uh, of uh, post, uh, vitrectomized cases have developed uh, higher risk of development of posterior capsular opacity with a rate of 8 to 51 percent cases in sequential surgery. And patients who have had uh, vitrectomy for repair of retinal detachment may develop redetachment following cataract surgery with a rate of 5.6 percent cases. So in surgical tips, we have to um, kept in mind that is CTR, iris retractor, or pupil dilating devices should be kept in hand even if uh, the pupil is dilated during preoperatively. To use reduced infusion pressure and lower the bottle height. And in posterior capsular plaque, posterior capsule prone to rupture, better to avoid hydrodissection and manage the case like a posterior polar cataract. And use of in intravitreal liquid perfusion to ensure intraoperative IPO control. Corneal only more likely, so we, we could uh, suture the main wound to prevent postoperative endophthalmitis. 
and also use of topical steroid for at least six weeks after surgery as uh, the, these cases more prone to uh, inflammation for prolonged period. Thank you all for patient sharing. Thank you, Dr. Fredo Dr. Jolly. And uh, as a VR surgeon, we have to give the pain, that is the pain to our cataract colleagues every time the vitrectomized they are taking this, this pain. Uh, now uh, I will request our next presenter, Dr. Prashant, uh, Dr. Prakash Chaudhary. Uh, he will be presenting on his case, the topic is our cataract. And uh, after this session, if time permits, we will take some questions. So now I request Dr. Prakash Chaudhary to present his topic. Respected delegates, good afternoon. So in next few minutes, I will be share my FACO pass for a small people. The surgical challenges with the small people are visualization is compromised and difficult to create optimum size axis that affects all steps of the FACO surgery, starting from the capsular axis up to the IOL implantation. As a consequence, it demands prolonged surgical time and there is more chance of damage to the other intercolor structures. A small people are of two types. Some of them are elastic due to diffuse atrophy of the dilator muscle which is mostly associated with IFIS. And some small people are non-elastic rigids and it is due to fibrosis and atrophy of the constrictor papillae and mostly we found it in the pseudo exfoliations. It is crucial to distinguish elastic and non-elastic people to appropriate some appropriate measures. The elastic people due to loss of muscle tone, they have usually floppy iris, that is dancing and fluttering movement of the iris during the normal irrigations. And people expand momentarily with the injections of the ovary and returns to its normal size. On the other hand, non-elastic rigid people, they don't have floppy iris and they do not ex expand with the injection of the OVD and usually they expand after the tearing of the pupillary margins that is after doing the pupilloplasty. Now I will share my surgical pulse to manage the small pupil without pupillary expansion device. To manage the sm small pupil without pupillary expansion device, I first routinely use intercameral epinephrine and lidocaine, preservative free, under the iris, then followed by high molecular cohesive OBD to improve the dilatation of people. This is sometimes helpful. But the, if the small people is non digit one, and if the small people is due to the, uh, that is due to the posterior sonica, in that case, intercameral mitratics and cohesive OBD are not effective. So 360 degree sonicolysis or stress pupillacity is you have to do, then it will be dilated. I always extend the uh, anterior capsules with tip and blue under soft shell technique to make the complete axis more confident and safely. I found this technique is better than the air bubble technique because it does not allow the anterior chamber and pupil to get collapse and greatly enhance the visibility of the anterior capsule without touching the corneal endothelium. Though making a complete axis is very critical and challenging with the uh, small pupil. It is wise to follow the pupillary margin to do axis as large as possible. And repeated injection of cohesive OBD is a good idea to keep the pupil dilate. Hydro decision should be judicious one, otherwise increased fluid pressure behind the iris will cause the iris prolapse. And to prevent this occurrence, I usually inject some amount of dispersive OBD over the iris, especially in the sub-insertion sub area, to achieve more pressure gradient above the iris. Then I do judicious multi-quadrant hydro dissection with a small band hydrocanola. 
injecting very small amount of fluid and every time after injecting I decompress the nucleus immediately so that the fluid pressures cannot build up behind the iris. And after successful hydro dissection I proceed for a sculpting and enough deep sculpting is the prerequisites to divide the nucleus into multiple small fragments. And I prefer to down, down slope sculpting as much as possible and my, I keep my inflow very low with corresponding low aspiration flow rate but optimum amount of ultrasounds. Here I am using 80% torsional ultrasound which is a hard cataract but my, but my aspiration flow is only 20 cc so that to avoid the risk of damage to the posterior capsules. To divide the nucleus I prefer to do a stop and chop technique with high vacuum. Here I am using 350 plus vacuum for a good hold in the nucleus. Again during chopping I, my inflow also very low because the when tip is occluded there is only inflow there is no outflow. So if, if I keep my inflow more that will causes more increased pressure behind the iris and causes iris prolapse and pupil size will be get down. It is very important to use optimal fluidic parameter during fragment removal. So we have to always keep in mind the output must, must be matched with the input. Slow motion FACO with torsional ultrasound is crucial to avoid increased fluid turbulence because with increased fluid turbulence the pupil size will be get down and slow motion FACO also useful to estray viscoelastic substance into the entry chamber. Torsional ultrasound the main advantage of the torsional ultrasound it has outstanding cutting efficiency and greatly enhance the followability because there is a no uh, there is a between the aspiration and energy there is a no conflict so it greatly enhance the followability to bring the lens matter close to the facultive here i am using 80 percent torsional ultrasound but my corresponding aspiration flow rate is only 20 cc still the followability is good and immersive with the fragments at center under the direct visualization I prefer to I prefer to do cortex aspirations with the bimanual eye. The main advantage of the bimanual eye, the irrigation and aspiration handpiece is separate, so the chamber is stability maintained very greatly. And to do that, first hold the cortex under the iris, and by doing the side to side swipe and tangential movement, I am separating the cortex from the capsular bag. I prefer to implant the IOL under cohesive body because it maintains the space and it is easy to remove and but care should be the attention should be paid so that both the haptics are into the bag. Here I am checking the uh, axis margin of the IOL and removal of OVD from in front and behind the IOL is very crucial because if any OVD left behind that will cause a sharp rise of intercular pressures post operatively. The pupil expansion device is the best option to manage the small pupil more confidently and safely. There are many pupil expansion devices by which we can achieve a stable surgical field and we can prevent the paraparative complications. Among the pupil expansion devices, iris hook is the strongest one because it fixes the iris with the limbus. But the main drawback with the iris hook, it needs some extra paracentesis, time consuming and pupil distortion is more. There are some ring devices that supports on the pupillary margins among which the malingering and behexing is most commonly practiced. But the advantage of the pupillary uh, uh, ring device, they don't need any extra wound, they are less time consuming and pupil distortion is less. So we all know the how to use the iris hooks. Uh, here I am making first four steps incisions in the diamond configurations a bit posteriorly at the limbus. I am using one millimeter slit line. Then I pass four iris hooks into the anterior chamber. Some surgeons they prefer five iris hooks. Then after being that, I inject some cohesive wood just below the pupillary margins to lift up the iris margins. Then engage the uh, hook to the pupillary border and make it tight. Then you can confidently you can complete the case. Here we can see during the engaging the behex ring, there is a rexis tears occurs extremely at the periphery. So in that case what I did, I removed the BHX ring, then I placed four iris hook to assess the extent of the re axis tear. Then I can see if I had this extreme periphery, then in anti-clockers directions, I lift up the axis and complete the axis. And finally, I complete the case successfully. So in case of zonular dehiscence or axis tear, in that case the iris hook is the most important part they play a role. 
it was a, here we can see the people is dilated before starting operations after making the side port and using the intercomer the the people says get down so i use four id soup to dilate the peoples and successfully complete the case bx in another wonderful device which was created by the dr shuvan bhattacharya from kolkata india it has six flanges out of which three flanges has hole which is tucked under the iris and three flanges has no hole that place above the iris and it has six notches that engage to the pupillary borders after making the side port i first place the bx sinks into the anterior chambers then through the side port using the 23 gauge forceps i first tuck the first pair of notch and simultaneously i engage the two notches through the pupillary border and similar way the second pair of notch and third pair of, no, after changing the hand third pair of notch is tuck so we can achieve a very good amount of size and removal is very easy because after disengage disengage the ring from the pupillary border border then it is easy to remove through the main ports the best part of the device it is extremely easy to remove from the eye it was a hard cataract with fluffy iris in fluffy iris there is a chance possibility of intraoperative myosis so to prevent paraoperative intraoperative myosis and iris prolapse i use bxing over here and successfully complete the case thank you so much for patience hearing thank you professor prakash what a beautiful surgery you showed us and uh, time is not very uh, with in our hand i will request our last presenter professor nuzat choudhury she is a professor of vitre retina of bangabandhu sheikh mujib medical university after this presentation we can take few cases if uh, our chairperson permits then we'll finish our session professor nuzat choudhury please honorable chairperson of the session co-chair moderator and uh, respected audience i first and foremost i'd like to um, thank ophthalmological society of bangladesh and all india ophthalmological society for uh, giving me this chance to present my uh, presentation here today for retina specialists and their patients intractable macular edema is a headache and a heartache how many do you give when is the end point how long it will continue when to switch when not to switch not to switch to what do we switch is it laser is it anti vegf is it intra ocular uh, steroid implant what 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 to do so what is the right foot forward in each patient what do the studies say so laser has always been the mo more prominent tool for treating the retinal disease until the anti vegf injections came and the paradigms has a paradigm has now shifted towards in favor of the anti vegf but is it is the time for laser over it certainly is not and that is what the studies say in case of diabetic retinopathy study and for etdrs it clearly demonstrated the benefit of laser therapy not only in diabetic macular edema but laser is actually indicated in a lot of retinal vascular diseases even in case of small children like in retinopathy of prematurity but we do consider the macular edema the clinically significant macular edema in um, most of the cases where the embarrassment for us and the heartache for the patient is most um, prominent so we would like to consider that first so the efficacy of prp was established like decades back when etdrs and drs has came uh, the, um, studies came protocol s of diabetic retinopathy clinical research network drcr.net found that anti vegf monotherapy is as effective as conventional prp but we must remember that the vegf costs money and it has it is an intraocular procedure with significant amount of stress for the patient 
Prior to uh, this anti-VEGF treatment, macular laser therapy was the mainstay. We used to, there was grid laser, and uh, there, even for CSME, we used to depend on the laser. Uh, since the publication of ETDRS in 1985, for three decades, it was the mainstay of the treatment. But as we all know that it not only decreases vision, in very few, only 3% of the patient can actually have any improvement, almost insignificant. So actually there, there is a decrease in vision for the macular edema, but there is no improvement of vision when you do the laser for CSME. <coughs> so you see sometimes, you, you can see that the laser burns, actually burns, and you lose the vision in that case. So laser treatment not only loses that functionality, it can lead to complications like choroidal neovascularization, visual field loss, decreased night vision, and fibrosis. So in, and, uh, as I have already, already said, that only 3% of the patients actually have any visual improvement. And the ex progressive expansion of the photothermal scars into the fovea or near to the fovea may actually affect the vision, especially in case of younger people. So we must be very aware of lasers. And when we consider, if you move on from diabetic macular edema to wet AMD, in pre-1980 there was no treatment actually. Then came the lasers, the thermal lasers, and then came the photodynamic therapy with vertiporphine, which became the main treatment for a long time until, of course, when the anti vegf therapy has come. And for, for the wet AMD patients, it has come as a, ma as a magic treatment. So what is the um, treatment modality today? If uh, we can see that anti vegf therapy does uh, s show reduction in blindness incidence uh, by uh, um, when we introduce anti vegf therapy, it not only decreases the blindness, it actually increases the number of lines, number of letters that the patient can read. So it, it improves vision. So early pivotal trials showed that significant visual gains with monthly ranumizumab is possible. The Merina 1, the Anchor, the Merina and Anchor, these studies definitely show that ranibizumab increases the visual gain. The rest uh, also shows that the visual outcome with laser is actually inferior compared to ranibizumab. So the superiority of the ranibizumab actually was uh, established by the restored studies. DRCR.net et al. compared laser, ranibizumab, and triamcilone. If you can see the graph, you'll see that ranibizumab with deferred laser gave the best possible uh, visual outcome by the later uh, uh, months. So laser therapy is um, obviously a treatment of choice for the macular edema, but when you have extrafoveal edema, uh, we can go for laser, but we do know that not, not only the number of injections is an issue, the economic burden is an issue, but we can also see that in a significant number of patients, like 40% of patients, we know that protocol I has uh, analyzed that 40% of patient will have persistent diabetic macular edema. So there are a lot of uh, no, new drugs coming up. Uh, we have been using ranibizumab and unlicensed bevacizumab and aflibarcep. Now the brolucizumab has come recently now on one of our uh, BVRS study. Uh, Dr. Niaz Abdul Rahman uh, showed a case where he has given 23 injections after that one injection of brolucizumab actually increased uh, the visual equities and uh, decreased the macular edema. So it is effective. But as I said, that the reason for switching, as you can see, insufficient fluid resolution, 62.7% cases. So 40% of the patients that we treat will have persistent diabetic macular edema. So in that case, what to do? We can. We can go for focal laser for the micro, leaking microaneurysms. There, um, some uh, surgeons do advocate the modified grid steel. We can always opt for the um, steroid implant like Ozodex. So what to do and when to do it should be catered to the patient's need. So in conclusion, anti vegf therapy in center involvement diabetic macular edema is the treatment of choice now. Focal laser is useful in case of extrafoveal edema. It 
Also, laser can help reduce the repeated anti-VEGF of injection, reduce the burden on the patient and the healthcare system. But because the subthreshold laser safety and repeatability and its use in retinal vascular disorder continues to be vi vital because of its safety and repeatability. Its specific role alone and in treatment algorithms with anti-VEGF and steroid treatment continue to be elucidated. We need to have more research into this algorithm where we, when we use anti-VEGF and how far we go and when to incorporate laser and when to go for the intra, uh, intravitreal ozodex implant. So other modalities like dexamethasone intravitreal implant are effective options also. But not all patients will be res uh, responding to the anti-VEGF therapy. So the alternates are very important. And it, it will also, as I am mentioning repeatedly, that it, is, it will ease the treatment burden of frequent injections. So more trials and more studies need to be f performed. Thank you all. Thank you, Professor Nuzat. Uh, as you know that Rolis uh, Jumab has got the FD approval on 27th of May. It got the FDA approval for diabetic macular edema. So we, we had four presentations, two on cataract surgery, one is vitrectomized eye, one is small people, one was uh, oculoplasty, and one was uh, on diabetic macular edema. Now I'm handing over the mic to our chairperson, Professor Abba Hossein, to contact the next part of the session. Any question to any speaker? First of all, just you may ask question or any comments i would like to as because there are four sub three subspecialty actually uh, so uh, dr niaz is here and i would like to say two comments on dr nuzad choudhury's presentation thank you madam thank you madam now first i'd like to um, address uh, uh, Dr. Jolly, because she did, uh, she spoke on uh, fake emulsification on vitrectomized eyes. Uh, that was a very nice presentation, Jolly. Thank you. You have covered nearly everything. But there are some very specific problems that we face as a vitreoretina surgeon and a cataract surgeon. I'm, I also do like you do. There are certain specific problems that we face in vitrectomized eyes as you go along, which I think uh, needed to be addressed. Uh, so there are two comments I'll make. One is if you want to stain the capsule in a vitrectomized eye, silicone has been removed, okay? There's no silicone. So if you want to stain with uh, uh, tripan blue, what happens? Have you ever given it? If you stain, give tripan blue, within a few seconds this will go in, in, inside it will mix up because it's all fluid, and you will lose your red reflex. You can't do surgery. So that is a very specific problem that you can face. If you have to give tripan blue, you will give it immediately, remove it, or you'll be prepared to wash it out from the posterior segment. So this is a very, very specific problem in vitreotomized eye. Number one. Number two is you have mentioned, but you didn't go into detail, that you, sometimes you cannot maintain the pressure. As you're doing, because there's no vitreous, it's all fluid. Whenever you are putting a phaco machine and doing aspiration, more fluid from the poches will come on, the eye will become soft. So you have to maintain pressure. In that cases, we put in through the parse planar one of our trocar cannula, attach it to saline, and regulate the IOP as we are doing cataract surgery. There are a few other more, but I just wanted to mention these are very specific uh, things. But as a whole, wonderful presentation. Thank you. Oh, Dr. Duzak's presentation was also very, very, very good. Yes. Uh, it, was, it was very good. And, and um, you see, one comment I want to make is always we are saying that, you know, ETDRS study uh, comparing. We cannot compare. ETDRS study was so far away. Sheshomai anti was not even invented. So you cannot compare. You compare apples to apples. So you cannot compare ETDRS study. Now you have to compare all the um, protocols. Uh, the, uh, protocol less and are where oh, both are available. Do compare these. Don't talk. We, uh, we, if you talk about ETDR study, it doesn't make sense because at that time there was no anti video. Yes, so laser still has a role, and as you've said, it has its good sides and its bad sides. But 
uh, uh, it's still there, we are still using it, but it's using it le less. And uh, now the newer drugs that are coming up, and as Tarek mentioned that on the 27th, we got approval for uh, brolosuzumab, and I'm sure bro with brolosuzumab, uh, we'll have uh, you know, better prognosis in diabetic macular edema. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Niaj. Next, uh, Professor Shakur is here. Dr. Mili, we call. And so please comment on Dr. Rifat's presentation, as because she has presented very nicely an excellent presentation on congenital ptosis. Thank you, Madam, for giving me the opportunity to comment on Risha's presentation, uh, Rifat's presentation. It's a wonderful presentation. She has covered everything. And, uh, but I have one um, comment. That is, you, you always say about um, supramaximal LPS resection. I have a little bit, I'm conservative about it. Because when you don't have the, the LPS function is poor, and you do the supramaximal LPS resection, it will not pull the lead. So it, it, it is written in the books also not to do supramaximal LPS resection when LPS uh, is poor, because it will go down after some time. So you have to do the revision surgery, and the revision surgery is frontal is brow suspension. So why don't you do the frontal is brow suspen uh, suspension in first go? So if you do the first go, then you don't have to do the revision surgery. This is my experience. Can I help you? Uh, Madam, actually, we are doing uh, in super maximal LPSR uh, when the LPS function is four. But if it is three to three, then we do not go for uh, super maximal levator resection. Yeah. But Madam, uh, we are doing, and a few cases, most of the cases, they are doing fine. They do not get uh, ptosis again. If the LPS function is four or more, we can go for levator resection. But if it is less than four, we have to go for sling surgery. Yes. Yeah. Very low uh, LPS function doing supramaxial LPS. That is not. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Mili. Uh, now, uh, about Dr. Prokar's presentation, he has nicely shown us uh, how efficiently he presented the small people and do the FACO. So Dr. Mahbub Rahman, the great FACO surgeon, is with us. Dr. Mahbub Rahman, please comment. Thank you, Manu. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation. And small people is always a problem for the FACO surgeon. And Prakash has very elaborately explained how he's dealing with the small people. And he has done it so well, and we are, we are very impressed. And uh, as I was discussing with Do Dr. Chopin, he's saying that uh, if the people size is half, the visibility is decreased by, by more than 80%. So the visibility is the, is the key factor in the outcome of surgery. So this is very important that we, we know how to tackle uh, the small people because this is what we face nearly every day. So Prakash has shown it very well, and uh, we are really proud of him. And I, today, out of the four pre presentation, uh, Rifat, I just wanted to say your video was excellent and really impressive. Thank you, very well done. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mahabub, uh, for your excellent comments. Now I would request Dr. Shakot to say, as because we are just uh, on time, and uh, Shakot to say a few words about all the presentation. Thank you, Madam. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizer, All India Ophthalmic Society, for giving uh, our society, Ophthalmic Society of Bangladesh, uh, opportunity to present and arrange one special session for Bangladesh. All presenters uh, did very well today, and I must congratulate them. And uh, especially, we, uh, we're looking forward in the Kochi, or uh, we will be, be more participants from the Bangladesh will present in Bangladesh session. Thank you, Madam. 
now our co-chairman, scientific committee chairman of Ophthalmological Society of Bangladesh, Professor Ashraf Said. Please give your comments. Thank you, madam. First of all, I again like to give thanks to the uh, authority of uh, this uh, All India Ophthalmology Society for giving us the opportunity to be here. And uh, our presenters, all the presenters, have presented very well documented, illustrated, and informative presentations. I think uh, two of our presenters uh, unable to come for unavoidable circumstances. If they would come, we could cover more sub specialities. We wish in next AIOS conference we will present more elaborate, more informative more impressive presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ashraf. Now, uh, I would like to express my heartfelt thanks to the honorable audience. And here, I would like to give special thanks to Professor Shah Monir Hussain, our former Director General, as because despite of his subject, his listening so minutely, I think he can also have the chance to comment. If I request him, he can uh, comment in like our comment. Nobody can think that he is not an ophthalmologist like that. So thank you very much. And I would like to thank uh, All India Society of Ophthalmology, the host country, to allow us, every time they are allowing us to um, make a Bangladesh session, international symposium. Though symposium means that uh, theme will be same, but we have accommodated, as already mentioned, uh, Professor Syed and uh, Dr. Tariq Rejali, that we can accommodate so many subspecialty. And today also, four speaker uh, presented so nicely oculoplasty, cataract in two different ways. That means vitreotomized uh, patient, how easily uh, Dr. Jolly has shown that uh, she nicely managed the cataract cases and also Prakash has managed the small people. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mahabhub has already commented on that. And the last, uh, but not the least, Dr. Nuzhat Choudhury. She has shown, Vito Retina has already covered in two uh, presenters. So Dr. Nuzhat Choudhury also did an excellent performance. So I'd like to thank our moderator all on a sudden, he moderated this session so nicely, effectively, efficiently. And he is our Secretary General, Ophthalmological Society of Bangladesh. So I would like to express my heartfelt thanks to all of you, including moderator, co-chairman, and uh, both are co-chairmen, and all of you, and all the technical person who are helping us. Thank you so very much. Thank you.